Good morning. Oh, it's really good to be with you today. Uh, whenever I'm at All Saints, um, I go on a little bit of a nostalgia trip. Uh, the very first time I ever stepped foot in this church, I believe I was a uh, second year student at Westmont College. And I happened to come to Pasadena to visit a church and just kind of be with some friends. And uh, George Rikas was preaching. It utterly terrified me. Um, <laughs> I didn't come back until a few years later. It still terrified me. <laughs> and today, um, as I get to visit, I, I now live outside of Washington, D.C. in the suburbs of Virginia. Um, all I can say is it is so wonderful to be here, to see your faces, to see old friends, and um, your presence in this building and just being with you here this morning gives such hope. I am thankful that you exist. And I will put this in my memory file about All Saints as the day that they f you all finally asked me to preach. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, thank you so much for inviting me to be here in this beautiful place that I have known so long and loved from afar. Not long ago, I was uh, talking to a friend uh, she is a liberal Christian pastor, and we were, not surprisingly, talking about all the things that are going on in the world today. It wasn't a very good conversation. It was a litany of ugliness. We were talking about the news and our own fears, our sense of loss and despair. And as we ran down this list, she said to me, I've never felt so at odds with the world around me. It's like I woke up and I, in a world that I didn't even know, that I don't recognize, and I don't know what to do. And she took a moment and she sort of laughed. She said, it feels so strange. It's almost as if I was a fundamentalist girl again, railing against the world when we thought the world was evil. In this text, today's text, which is Jesus' prayer for his disciples right before, where it falls in um, the Gospel of John, of course, is, is after uh, Monday, Thursday, and before what happens in the Easter cycle weekend. Um, but these are his last words to his disciples before his death, and it's his pr a prayer for them. The word that is used most frequently in this passage is world. It's all about the world. And in this prayer, Jesus sets up a contrast, a contrast between the world and the word. In Greek, those two words used for world and word are cosmos and logos. In the New Testament, the word cosmos is used in three ways. And that's, that's kind of annoying, but it just is the way that Greek is. And uh, those three ways are really important to understand in relationship to this text and in relationship to the comments that were made by my, my friend. The first meaning that cosmos bears is the universe, the cosmos, cosmic wonder, all of creation. The second possible meaning of cosmos is the earth and all of its inhabitants. All of us, all the creatures, all the plants, everything that is here on Earth. And the third meaning that cosmos bears is the earthly order of things. That is how we human beings order the world. It means worldly affairs, goods, wealth, power, politics, privilege, and social structures. Everything that makes up the order of the earth. 
it's pretty clear that for most of this passage, that the third definition is in play. Jesus, when he's talking about the world here, is talking about the order of things, how we human beings have structured stuff. And in this case, Jesus is particularly worried about the disorder of things. For in the passage when he talks about the world, he's talking about the need to protect his followers, to take care of them, to love them, to make sure that they know they are with him and in him and that he is with and through them. Because he's holding on to them over and against the disorder of things. And there's a reason for that, because the, the cosmos, this order that we human beings have created, is in chaos. It is a chaos that is full of violence and lies and hatred that wishes to persecute the dream of, of God. It is about that chaos and God's goodness. And so, as Jesus prays, he's not ever praying that the chaos would just sort of disappear, or he's not praying that, um, he's not praying for the chaos. He actually says that in the prayer. He says, I'm not praying for the world, which is a very strange thing for Jesus to say, unless you understand. He says, I'm not praying for this disordered, chaotic structure of things. Instead, I'm praying for you those of you who I am about to leave behind. And he offers us an alternative to the chaos. That alternative is the word, the Greek logos. And there he is saying that chaos, the cosmos, this stuff is in tension with the word, with the logos. If you know the Gospel of John at all, or if you know it deeply and well, you might know that in this Gospel, Jesus is depicted at the very beginning as the Logos, as the Word of God. And so the Logos and Jesus are one and the same. But Logos is also something a bit more than Jesus' own person. The word logos in Greek also refers to reason, the case for, the fact of, the ground of. Logos is a story that gives meaning and purpose and shape to all that is. And so Logos enfolds both of these beautiful meanings. Logos is Jesus, and it is also the story that Jesus tells. And in the Gospel of John, the story that Jesus tells has one single narrative power from beginning to end, and that is it is a story of love. It is a story of a God who creates in love, a God who loves the world so much that God sends Jesus to live in the world. It is a story of the love that the disciples have for one another and that we have for Jesus and that we have for all of creation. It is a story of love. And that is what God had hoped would always be the story of the cosmos, love. Instead, of course, we human beings took the cosmos and we ordered it in this disordered and chaotic way. And so this version of the cosmos, the structure of the place in which we live, has become a story of not love. And God here, Jesus in this prayer is drawing us back to the deepest meaning of Logos, love. Jesus does a few things with this concept of Logos that are quite beautiful in Greek. He expands them out to include the name of God. 
He says at the beginning of the prayer, Jesus prayed for his disciples, I have made your name known to those whom you have given me from the world. And in Jesus' world, when you use the word name, it wasn't like, oh yeah, her name is Diana, and there is the person of Diana. But rather in Jesus' world, the name and the person, the character of the person, were interwoven into a single reality of identity. And so when Jesus prays for his disciple, I have made your name known, he's not just saying, I have made God's name known through the whole of the earth. He is saying, I have revealed, I have manifested your identity and your character to these people here who are now following the Logos. The very identity of God is in this community, is with these people. And so he gives them the name, and then he goes on and he says, I also am sanctifying them with truth. And that word makes me stop. Because that 18 or so year old girl who came into All Saints on that day so long ago from an evangelical college just up the road, when I used to use the word truth in a religious context, it always meant one thing. And that meant doctrinal correctness, right dogma. And so it would be easy to mistake this passage for saying that because we in our culture are so influenced by uh, evangelical religion and the definitions of these words that have been put before us by that religious tradition throughout so much of our culture. But truth does not mean that in Greek. Instead, what truth means is reality. Reality. The disordered world of the cosmos is division, violence, hatred, and fear. And Jesus says over and against that disorder is the logos, reason, and a story of love that is the expression, the very character of divine reality. In a very real way, Jesus is saying all that stuff, that disorder of the world, that way that you think the world is, that is so hurtful and vile, that is full of lies, dishonesty and hatred, that is not reality. What reality is, is here. The Logos the ground of all that is, the word, love, this, this, being in relationship with this is reality. And so the prayer moves to the place where it says, Jesus utters these words, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. It's not about some sort of external sense of doctrine. It means reality. Ground the followers of the Logos in your reality. We might reinterpret those words as saying, set apart those who follow the story of love. For that story, that story is what is real. And this, of course, delivers us right to our moment. Right to our moment. Right to the comments of my friend who is a pastor who says, I just don't feel at home in the world. I'm a liberal Christian. I'm supposed to feel at home in the world. But I don't because the world has become so disordered. The world doesn't feel real. I feel like I've woken up in a nightmare. And you know what? She's right. She got it exactly right. That is what this prayer is saying. 
There is no room in God's reality for anything about lying or dishonesty or violence or hatred or abuse or cutting people apart, setting us on edge, introducing fear as the main motivating, fact, uh, motivating emotion. That world is not the cosmos but is rather a corruption of it here now. And this corruption that we also refer to with this world cosmos is in direct opposition to the sacredness of all of creation and the universe. Thus, the worldly cosmos that we inherit is in tension with the cosmos that God created the cosmos that God dreams of, the cosmos of the kingdom of love. And so what this prayer becomes is absolutely beautiful and one that we need so much right now. Jesus prays that we would be protected and delivered from the lie of the disordered world that the corruption of the disorder would never become the story that we live in or the story out of which we dream or the story that colonizes us. That is not what God wants. God instead asks that we would be delivered out of those lies into the reality of love. The cosmos that God has had on God's heart since before the very beginning. The cosmos of light, of unity, of grace, of gifts, abundance, and gratitude. This is not a prayer of escape. It is not a prayer that our enemies will be smote. It is a prayer for discernment that we would be able to see with new eyes what is real and what is not real. And being able to see what is real, being able to see the truth, we would live in relation to God's dream for the cosmos. We are to live in truth. I want to hang that over my desk. I want to make a bumper sticker about that. I want to proclaim it on the streets right now. No more lies. Only truth, reason, clarity, the ground of. These are what will bring about our wholeness. These are what will save us. These things are what will heal us. These things are what will truly make us who we are supposed to be as human beings, living in the love and grace of God and loving and caring for one another. We do not belong to a disordered world. We might have to live in it, but we are not of it. The cosmos works against what it means to be fully human. That disorder takes away our humanity. But we rightly belong to the cosmos. The utterance, the word of love that was with God in the beginning. That is truth. There's a huge and beautiful poetic irony around this throughout the whole book of John. For in the beginning we are told that the logos, the word, was the creative face of the cosmos. That that word was with God in the beginning and that nothing will over, ever overcome that word. And then in John chapter 3, Jesus says that God so loved the cosmos. Jesus doesn't hate the world. Jesus hates the disordered world. Jesus loves the world because Jesus was sent to save and heal and love it all. The cosmos and the cosmos. And so here, as we are gathered today, 
in this place. We are to act in this disordered cosmos. We're not called to escape it, but we work for the cosmos of God's dreams, that reality. A good friend of mine who lives in New Zealand writes liturgies, and uh, he writes liturgies for every single week of the Christian year. I just went last night to look and see what his prayer was for today, what words he would frame this amazing reading about the disordered cosmos and the beautiful cosmos with. These are his words. It's a short liturgy to take us deeply into this reality. We believe in a light that smothers darkness. It tears through every shadow of our world and leaves a clarity brighter than the sun. We name that light God. We believe in a love that crushes hatred and leaves a space for forgiveness to rebuild, redesign, and recreate our world. And we name that love God. We believe in a truth that rips through injustice, revealing a different vision for our world of freedom, fairness, and future. And we name that truth God. We believe in a hope that rattles oppressors, shaping the intent of the creator for a people destined for love. And we name that hope God. We believe in a time toward which all history travels, where our lives will be held and bound into eternity. And we name that time. God. Amen. <laughs>